Good evening. At this time, we're going to have a moderation by Dr. Tim McNamara. Dr. Tim McNamara, can you unmute? Yep. Is that all I need? Start video? Don't start video. Just do the moderation, please. All right. Good evening. My name is Tim McNamara. I will be your moderator for this class. Welcome to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. Mm -hmm. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Lansing Branch was established in 1973. The Dean is Dr. Terry Welsh, and the President is Dr. Tina Pettigrew. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the heavenly father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted with Lord. The okay. true title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been you improperly hungry? substituted with the title God. The name Our of the time. Holy Spirit okay, manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted with the name Jesus. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Father and his Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is spirit. And in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, 
Everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and both modern and practical occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now 
in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. At this time, we will have a prayer by Dr. Lenore Allen. Our scripture for this evening is Revelation, the 20th chapter, to be read by Hyacinth Lindo. Choir. Um, brethren, let us gather together and ask Yahshua the Messiah, our husband and our intercessor, to cause us to focus deeply on him both now and forever because he is the cause of eternal life. Let us all say in one in, one, in unison, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do we have a scripture reader? The you want me to read it? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Revelation, the 20th chapter? Yes. The 20th, okay. Revelation, the 20th chapter. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottle and spit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nation no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must lose a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yahshua, and for the word of Yahweh, and which had not worshipped the beast. Neither is idol, neither had this received the, its mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with the Messiah a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that had path in the first resurrection. On such the second death art no power, but they shall be priests of Yahshua and of the Messiah and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of prison and shall go out to deceive the nation which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog, Magog, together with them, together to battle, number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and come past the camp of the saints about and the city and the and the beloved city, and fire came down from Yahweh out of heaven and devoured them. And the adversary that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone with the beast and the false prophet, and shall be and shall be tormented day and night for the age. And I saw a great white throne, and in that sit on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before Yahweh, and the book were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things, which were written in the book according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the dead and sure delivered of the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And the dead and sure were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life 
was cast into the lake of fire. I've read Revelation, the 20th chapter. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Um, tonight is our, our Elohim book. And for those of you that have the Elohim book, we are on page 69. And we are covering the topic of the vision of Moses and the Apostle John in comparative analysis or apostolic confirmation of the creation of the old and new heaven and earth as pertaining to the purpose of Yahweh. And I believe our speaker for this evening is our Dean, Dr. Terry well, Walsh. I'm sorry, before that, we okay. were going to have Dr. Um, oh. Karen Martin. Okay, sorry. So, That's okay. Yep. Dr. Karen Martin will be answering a question first before we proceed. Um, okay. question. Yes, so go ahead. Good evening, good evening. I won't take long, it's not much because I'll be referring uh, I might be posting a lecture that was given by Dr. Will Williams on the 15th of, I think it's the 15th of September. Karen, do you, could, you, could you restate the question? Okay, I will be. I will be restating okay. the question. Okay. Right, but what I'm saying, I won't be long with this because I will be sharing a lecture done by Dr. Will Williams on the 15th of September 2015, where he did a full explanation of the book of Revelation and the seals. But the question is, and um, this question was asked by Timothy Anwar. I hope he's on YouTube tonight. It says, the king of the locals, that's Daniel the ninth chapter, Daniel 9 and verse 11. His question was, the king of the locusts was identified in Revelation as Abaddon in Hebrew and Abalion in Greek. Please touch more on this as John is seeing the same thing as Moses, but in the end. But just by looking at this verse, which is Revelation 9 and 11, you would have to read the full Revelation, the ninth chapter, to get an understanding of exactly what it is talking about. So I um, can can the reader get Revelation the ninth chapter, please? All right, Revelation the ninth chapter. Mm -hmm. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Okay, can and, just pause for me. So it says, and the fifth angel sounded, and the fifth angel, you know, that's Yahshua, and he said, and the fifth angel sounded, and he saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth. Now that star falling from heaven was Lucifer as he was cast out of heaven into this earth. And it says, unto him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now who has the key of the bottomless pit? That's Yahshua. And he said, and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit. Now for us to fully understand Revelation, the ninth chapter, you'd have to go back and I'm not going to go into all the scriptures. I'll just mention them. You will have to go back to Revelation, the first chapter to see where John was when John said he was on the Isle of Patmos on Yahshua's um, day, which is on the day of eternity. So he was in eternity. And he said, um, so looking back, when he talked about the seven trumpet, because the book of Revelation spoke about the seven trumpet, it spoke about the seven, um, it spoke about the seven trumpet, it spoke about the seven seals and the seven angels. 
So you would have to know when you talk about the seven trumpets, it's talking about the seven days of creation according to Moses' vision. When it's talking about the seven seal, it's talking about the dispensation. And when even when you read over Revelation, the 20th chapter that we just spoke about, it was talking about that angel and he opened he had the key, the same angel that had the key to the bottomless pit. Now the seventh dispensation, when you look at the, this, can you bring the dispensation card up for me, please? Um, are you hearing me clearly? Okay, thank you. Right, so, and if you can, okay, let me, when you look at this dispensation and they talk about the seventh angel, that angel um, that it is talking about here, it's talking right at the fifth dispensation here, because if you um, continue reading Revelation, continue reading Revelation and then I can. Um, all right, I'm at the uh, fourth verse. Mm -hmm. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of Elohim in their foreheads. Okay, so at this, when you um, look at it, here it is speaking right at the fifth dispensation here, and this is on the day of Pentecost. And um, when it speaks about um, they shall not hurt any grass of the field, it's talking to mankind or those souls or those sons that are sealed on the day of Pentecost. They could not affect them. And those scorpions that it is talking about is those satanic spirit or the unrighteous mystery. So it could not affect them or right? they were Yahweh didn't give them power to hurt the sons. What you talk about the grass. And this is why when you read it, it will tell you how men are equated to grass or trees. Continue reading. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, mm -hmm. but that they should be tormented five months. Mm -hmm. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he and spoke at the end. And that five months, you will see a principle of the five months or 150 days from Genesis on down in the scriptures. So when you talk about that five months, it's talking about 150 days. And then on the, um, as I was saying, I was doing some investigation and I saw where Dr. Will Williams and he's very good at um, calculations. And I saw where he used the 150, the three months there, because it's 30 days that is equal to a month and three, the three months or the 150 days, he would equate that to three Pentecost in Yahshua's ministry. And that three Pentecost, um, you have the first year would be a Pentecost, the second year a Pentecost, the third year would be three Pentecost, which is 150. Continue reading. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Mm -hmm. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold. And, and that's the satanic mystery and the doctrine that is happening right now in our time or right within this fifth, the fifth and sixth dispensation that we are actually living in. And so those locusts that it is talking about, it's a satanic mystery or the unrighteous mystery. Go ahead. And their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running into battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And that's and the erroneous, and that's the doctrine of the unrighteous mystery that is unleashed or going on in our time now. Because we are in the in this dispensation, the fifth or the sixth dispensation. That's where we are actually living. Read. 
and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon. And thank you. And that's Lucifer or the unrighteous mystery and his doctrine. So that's what that part exactly was speaking about. But so so for, for the regarding the question, the, I'm going to post the lecture that was given in 2015 in the group and whoever want to get a full understanding of the book of Revelation can refer to that lecture and it will give you in depth because it will give you from the first seal to the seventh seal and where Dr. Kinley is the seventh seal and he did mention that in his pine on um, the lecture that was given in Pine City and that's all I have to say on that question. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. All right, now we will continue with today's uh, lecture, which again is um, Elohim Book, Volume 1, page 69. And our speaker for this evening is Dr. Terry Welsh. Well, good evening. <clears throat> so I'm glad that she covered that section there in the book of Revelation because uh, the part that we're going to address in the book, uh, textbook today, does deal with the book of Revelation, the Apostle John's visions, what's recorded in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> and to understand what John is referring to, you also refer to what Moses uh, wrote in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and that's because Yahweh Elohim gave Moses and John the same vision. He gave the same to Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in 1931 also, and uh, they're expressing the same principles. Uh, John is uh, referencing things, obviously, in a different time than Moses in using somewhat different allegorical language. But the principles remain the same, even though the manifestations, the figures, the symbols that are being used may be different. So if we could simply go to page 69 of volume one of Dr. Kinley's Elohim book, you'll see that section has a long title that Dr. McNamara had quoted here, and that, okay, yep, once we get, uh-huh, page 69 would be the, the, that's it, right there, you passed it, right, come on, there, that page, and we'll start at the section down there where it says, vision okay and if we've got readers then uh be probably better if somebody else read maybe i can make a couple of comments here and there um and at this point i'm not able to see the book on the screen i don't know if anybody else can or not um i'm looking for some feedback here Vision of Moses and the Apostle John in comparative analysis or apostolic confirmation of the creation of the old and of the new heaven and earth as pertaining to the purpose of Yahweh. Okay, thank you. Hold on no, one more. It's please. not on the screen. I'm just wondering. Yes. Uh, can we get the book text? Yes. Um, can you guys give me a moment, please? My, my screen just, I'm working with the windows and... Money's going. Hold on. Do what you got to do. <laughs> okay, one moment. Yeah, I want everybody to be able to read along as we do this. This book is a what we call the textbook. 
colloquially. It's uh, Dr. Kinley's writings. Um, it's called Elohim, the Archetype, Original Pattern of the Universe. And it sufficiently explains the things that Dr. Kinley saw in his vision to get it across. And basically, if you look into it, you'll find it's an explanation of the things that are in the Bible, such as this entire section deals with. Uh, Dr. Kinley would very often talk about taking things from Genesis to Revelation. And that's because Moses wrote Genesis by the same vision that John wrote the Revelation by the same vision. And um, so when we have that page in view, I'd like to start reading. And let me mention this kind of while we're waiting also, uh, Dr. Martin had referenced Revelation, the first chapter. We didn't go there, but if you go to Revelation, the first chapter, there is a lot that shows that what he, John, is describing there is the same vision by the pattern that Moses uh, wrote about back in Exodus and then uh, Genesis on through Deuteronomy. Um, and the pattern of the tabernacle is shown there with the tabernacle coming out of the temple right there in the first chapter of Revelation. And uh, in the last chapter of Revelation, you'll see it as it goes back into the temple, um, which is the glorified spiritual body of Yahshua. So anyway, so now we have that section. I don't know if she can enlarge it, whether you can or not. I'm just... I'm going to give you control of the mouse. Mm, okay. All we need to do is be able to see the text. I want to scroll. I don't know if I can scroll. Yeah, you're getting it set there. Okay, well, whatever we do. All right. Um, Go ahead and take control. Dr. Underwood. Okay. <laughs> All right, I can't scroll, though, can I? Uh, I'm going to try and do this. It's not working very well. Yeah. Apparently, I can't scroll. All right, I'm going to leave it just like that, and we'll have to deal with it because I cannot seem to control it properly. Um, Dr. Underwood, please go ahead and read. The only reason for this writing, for writing this summary, is because there are many world famous theologians and biblical commentators who do not believe that the mosaic visions and writings of the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible have anything in particular to do with the visions and the book of Revelation written by the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. To entertain such an erroneous idea is to deny that all scripture is given by the inspiration of Yahweh and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In order to prove the fallacy of such mis a mistaken conclusion, we will begin this summary by correlating the experiences and visions of Moses with the experiences and visions of the Apostle John according to the purpose of Yahweh, who is the archetype pattern of the universe, reflecting himself in the first three of these physical patterns as recorded in the Pentateuch, namely, A, Noah's Ark, B, the Exodus and migration from Egypt through the wilderness of Sinai to Canaan land, C, the tabernacle, 
erected by Moses and D, the temple in Jerusalem recorded in 1 Kings 6, 1 through 38 and 2 Chronicles. Okay, According so let me make a quick comment in there. Um, so Dr. Kinley's talking about the fact that Moses' visions, which were recorded uh, as in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, do directly relate with the things that are written in the book of Revelation. And most of the Bible scholars seem to not recognize this uh, relationship. And he's uh, also talking about the fact that to understand the relationship uh, that uh, you need to understand something about Yahweh's divine pattern and how that the pattern organizes the principles in a way that you can uh, correlate the experiences and the visions that are written both by Moses and John and see them together, see how they correlate because you're lining them up by the same pattern and that allows you to visualize the relationships, okay? And he talks about that pattern, particularly Yahweh Elohim is the archetype or the original pattern of the universe, but there's uh, manifestations that Yahweh Elohim used in the Bible, the first thing he had built was Noah's Ark. It had three stories, upper, middle, and lower story. Then uh, Moses, he had, at, uh, with the children of Israel, migrate out of the land of Egypt through the wilderness of Sinai into the promised land or Canaan land. That's threefold. So that's three parts. Then he had uh, them build the tabernacle, which had a most holy place, holy place in court round about which is three parts, and then the temple in Jerusalem, which had an oracle, a sanctuary, and a porch, and was basically a greater and more glorified tabernacle. And these patterns are yeah, uh, Dr. Kinley is going to use to compare the writings of Moses with the writing of John in the book of Revelation. All right, please continue reading. According to the purpose of Yahweh, all visions revelations, prophecies, and experiences must follow the Yahweh Elohim given pattern of the migration, tabernacle, and temple. Here and now, we intend or aim to show the experiences of Moses down in Egypt and of the vision and experiences given to him in 1490 B.Y., and thereafter in the wilderness of Sinai in correlation to the Apostle John's visions and experiences during the three and a half years from AD 30 to AD 33 and a half. While he was with Yahshua during the time of his earthly ministry and to John's visions given in AD 96 on the Isle of Patmos, which together depict the summation of the whole matter. It is the migratory pattern or the journey from Egypt through the wilderness of Sinai to Canaan land with Moses, Joshua, and the children of Israel that we mainly desired to refer in showing the infinite relationship of the experiences and visions of John. All right, so Dr. Kinney is going to use the migratory pattern, the trek or uh, migration of the children of Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land, and the events there are going to be used to correlate the things that Moses wrote with the things that John wrote and also experienced uh, with Yahshua the Messiah, who uh, John or who uh, John was with during his ministry, and who Yahshua fulfilled the law. Okay, so let's go to the next page, and you'll see here that there's a portion where it shows uh, about Moses, shows about John, and then they'll show a comparison. Please go ahead and continue. 
Moses in Egypt had experienced the slaying and eating of the Paschal lamb of the Passover before he and the children of Israel passed through the miraculously divided waters of the Red Sea and later arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. It was here in the cloud atop Mount Sinai that Moses saw the visions of the Elohim of Israel, the tabernacle and the creation of heaven and earth, the earth being surrounded by water. It was here in the wilderness of Sinai in 1490 B.Y. that Moses wrote the Pentateuch or the first five books of the law, which were to govern the Israelites throughout their generations in the wilderness and in the land of Canaan. OK, so here he's talking about the fa uh, Moses receiving the visions from Yahweh Elohim in the wilderness of Sinai, atop Mount Sinai, uh, in the midst of a cloud, which represents or symbolizes spirit in the realm of eternity. We will have a picture or plate uh, drawing that will show that in a minute. So just hold on. You'll be able to visualize what he's talking about. But Moses went up on top of Mount Sinai which is the mountain where Yahweh Elohim had spoken down the law and the Ten Commandments and made the covenant or the testament with Israel uh, called the Old Covenant. And then Moses was taken up into Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, twice. So he was up there for a total of 80 days and 80 nights lifted out of his physical body as far as his soul in other words, not being restricted to the limitations of his flesh. And Yahweh Elohim was communicating with him spirit to spirit and showing Moses the things about himself. And that is shown well on this Moses chart. So since that chart is up, let me kind of show you a couple of things about it. I don't know if I've got control of that pointer. Um, if I do, you can see my pointer uh, circling Moses up here in Mount Sinai. And, um, I, okay, hopefully I've got control of the pointer. It doesn't look the same, but on this chart, you'll see, ah, there we go. Thank you. Here in the upper left corner, you will see, and this chart is called Elohim, the archetype, which means original pattern of the universe. And that's here. Yahweh Elohim is the archetype or the original pattern of the universe he created everything by himself or by the pattern. That's why this says creation by the pattern. That's shown in various different plates, the seven days of creation that's in the book of Genesis, uh, the first chapter. So Moses went up on the top of Mount Sinai here, and he was here for 40 days and 40 nights with Yahweh Elohim, the creator, in the midst of this phenomenal burning fiery cloud. It was a pillar of cloud, darkness clouds, thick darkness, like sooty black uh, smoke uh, during the day. And then by night, it turned into a pillar of fire. And this was with the children of Israel, leading them through the wilderness of Sinai for 40 years. So actually the children of Israel never had darkness uh, for those 40 years, as long as they were staying by this cloud, because it would give them street lights, <laughs> so to speak, pillar of fire by night to give them uh, light by night. Moses goes up into this cloud, and he's there for 40 days and 40 nights, getting direct communication with Yahweh Elohim uh, to Moses' soul. His body is just laid out, but Moses' spirit or soul is lifted from his body, so to speak. And Yahweh Elohim appears to him and gives him a uh, vision of himself and his purpose from the very beginning to the very ending. And then he does the same thing with the Apostle John recorded in the book of Revelation. And this is on the Isle of Patmos many years later. This is 1,490 years before the birth of Yahshua with Moses. And this is 
uh, 96 years after the birth of Yahshua, uh, 63 years after his death, burial, and resurrection with the apostle John. So they're over 1,500 years apart, almost, almost 1,600 years apart. But Yahweh Elohim gives John the same vision, and John sees Yahweh Elohim glorified at the beginning of his vision, where Moses sees Yahweh Elohim, I'll, I'll call what we say in his everyday work clothes at the beginning of the vision. Uh, so it proceeds from the beginning to the ending. Moses sees it from beginning to ending, but John sees Yahweh Elohim glorified or Yahshua glorified at the beginning of his vision, which is the ending of Moses' vision. So we say John saw it from the ending to the beginning. He didn't see it played backwards, but he saw the ending of it at the beginning of his vision. He saw the ending of Moses' vision at the beginning of John's vision and vice versa. So anyway, okay. Um, point is Dr. Kennedy's gonna use this migratory pattern and the things that are here in both John and Moses are going to describe the same principles using somewhat different words but those principles are manifested in this uh, pattern of the migration, which uh, follows the pattern of the tabernacle, which really manifests the archetype or the original pattern, which is Yahweh Elohim. Okay, now that I've said that a few times, hopefully that'll sink in and we'll now proceed with the reading. John in Palestine had experienced and witnessed the complete ministerial life of Yahshua 63 years before he arrived on the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea, where he saw the visions of Yahshua the Messiah, the tabernacle, and creation of the new heaven and earth, which was drawn out of or typified by the old heaven and earth. It was here in the year AD 96 on the Isle of Patmos that John was to bear record of the word of Yahweh and the testimony of Yahshua the Messiah and of all things that he saw. Here, John was told to write what he saw and heard in the vision and revelation and send it to the seven assemblies which were in Asia. We shall recall your attention to chart series number one on which is indicated by numbered arrows, the sequence of events to be summarized in relation to Moses and John's confirmatory visions. All succeeding numbers indicated in this summary can be followed by the numbered arrows de designated on the charts. Okay, maybe I can show that to you, hopefully. Um, it's in the textbook here, so there we go. All right, well, wow, hold on. There we go. You got to go back. Got to uh, start at one. Different chart. Correct. Yeah. Oh, we've zoomed ahead. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, you want the chart on page 73. Thank you. Waiting for it to come. Okay, there we are. Yes, and you'll see that there are several uh, depictions arrows. of this similar chart, but the arrows will be different and certain things on the chart will be emphasized or different um, in each version of this. Um, but the point here is we saw that Moses chart before. This is a black and white version. Moses is up here in the cloud having the vision with Yahweh Elohim. John is over here in the Isle of Patmos having the vision and the revelation of Yahshua the Messiah. The two are seeing the same thing and one is confirming the other. And that's what Dr. Kinley said his 
job was to confirm all the things that Moses and John and, and the prophets <laughs> wrote, not to contradict them. But um, you will see here that there are various arrows that are pointing to different things. And he will explain this as he goes through. So I think what I'm going to do is keep this picture uh, up so people can see it for right now. And uh, Dr. Underwood, you can go ahead and read. I don't know if I can get this off. No, um, I don't want to mess anything up. So um, Okay. Yeah, so, just just hold on a second. Let me leave this up for a minute. And I'll get you that other chart up here in a second. Just give me okay. a moment. Okay. No, that's fine. And in the meantime, you're welcome to read on a little bit, David. Please. Arrow number one compared to arrow number one a. The account which Moses, together with Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the seventy elders saw concerning the Elohim of Israel in superincorporeal anthropomorphic form. And the tabernacle, which Moses saw, is compared to John's vision of Elohim on the Isle of Patmos in AD 96. Elohim himself is the true temple, which is his superincorporeal body, in whom we live, move, and have our being, for Yahweh is spirit, encompasses all, for he is all in all. Okay, now that language I hope you're familiar with. We discussed that and explained a little bit about that in prior sessions, uh, prior uh, session, or anthropomorphic form that Dr. Kinley is referring to here. And in reality, he is that original pattern. Now, since everything operates by the pattern, um, then it's as if everything was in the pattern. We're not talking about being inside the pattern spatially. We're not talking about a space that's larger than another space because actually the pattern existed and exists independent of space and independent of time. Time and space are parts of Yahweh Elohim's creation. Both are threefold or both are by the pattern. So actually the pattern is not in space and time. Space and time are in the pattern, so to speak, or within the scope of how the pattern operates and dictates that everything operates in space and time. Space has height, width, and depth three dimensions. Time has past, present, and future vectors. Three vectors, three dimensions, because why? It's because the archetype pattern, which controls space and time and every created object, is threefold. Yahweh is the threefold spirit possessing the power of transmutation into his two states, incorporeal and physical. And so, that threefoldness is going to be implicit in everything that he creates. Everything is going to be within the scope of the pattern or within the superincorporeal anthropomorphic form of Yahweh Elohim. Okay, and I'm waiting for that chart. <laughs> so um, uh, while we're waiting, just go ahead, please, and read on a little bit more. Moses, arrow one. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the Elohim of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a pavework of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And look that thou make them the tabernacle and its furnishings after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. Okay, so now we've got a yeah, nice colored chart here. Good. So you see again, Moses in the mountain, John on the Isle of Patmos, arrow number one here, 
compares with arrow number 1A here, then there's 2 and 2A, 3 and 3A, okay? So we'll deal with those particular things. And it says back there in Exodus, dealing with Moses, that then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. That's these people here, along with Moses. And it says they saw the Elohim of Israel. That's Yahweh Elohim right here. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. It shows it as a blue item here, kind of like the circle of the earth is referred to in the Bible. And if you look at the earth from outer space, uh, the water reflects the blue uh, refracted light in the atmosphere. And so it looks like a blue sapphire. And so heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. And so Yahweh Elohim is displaying that principle to Moses when he shows him the vision like this. And this is the way it's being depicted here in a vision. Moses describes him um, as the body of heaven in this clearness, which means brightness or brilliance. This body shone brighter than the noonday sun. This sun came from this sun and the brightness of this sun is pale in comparison to the brilliance of Yahweh Elohim. So anyway, so he's talking here uh, that he told Moses up here to build a physical tabernacle in Mount Sinai, exactly like the pattern he had seen in the mountain. And what Yahweh Elohim did with Moses in the vision was showed himself in this great superincorporeal anthropomorphic form Moses was incredibly impressed, but he did not understand Yahweh Elohim in that state. He was far too great. So what Yahweh Elohim did was give Moses a way to have a bit-by-bit -bit comparison, and he showed him first this threefold tabernacle pattern compared to the threefold anthropomorphic embodiment. He is Yahweh Elohim Yahshua here, or the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in one embodiment, not three persons, one spirit in three states. And so the tabernacle pattern was shown to Moses with three compartments, a most holy place, holy place, court roundabout. And he spent actually 33 days giving Moses all the detailed description of the things in this tabernacle and how they were supposed to be built. Oh, great. That's wonderful. And then he told Moses to build this physical tabernacle exactly like the pattern that he had seen in Mount Sinai. So it would have a most holy place, holy place court roundabout here, and there would be a physical high priest operating the services here, which would represent Yahweh Elohim operating the services in his universe, where he is the, uh, the pattern and the priest that operates everything. Okay, wow. Okay, yeah, we've got a whole series of these great pictures. Glad you got those. All right, so now go to John uh, 1a there. We talked about Moses with one. Now let's talk about John with 1a. And it doesn't matter whether we, okay, that's good. There's the one and the 1a. Moses is seeing Yahweh Elohim and describe him with the body of heaven and his brightness, brilliance, great superincorporeal form. John is going to describe Yahweh Elohim in his glorification over here uh, at the very first chapter of the book of Revelation. They're both looking at Yahweh Elohim. Only Moses is looking at him here, and this would be at, at the beginning of his purpose, what we call the everyday work clothes. Here we would, he would see him, John would see him first in his glorified uh, spirit embodiment uh, after he has finished fulfilling uh, and, and ascended into great glorification. Okay, so, but they're still seeing Yahweh Elohim, both of them. All right, please continue reading in John 1a. John, arrow 1a. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. 
And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Okay, so and I it, don't think, I, I'm sorry, uh, hold on just a second. I, I don't think I've got a, uh, the ability to show you with the cursor, but if everybody will look, at where John the Apostle is looking at Yahweh. Ele oh, good. I got the cursor, I think, in just a second. Whoops. Huh. Um, okay. I'm trying to match. There we go. All right. So what he just read about is what John the Apostle saw and is describing in the first chapter of the book of Revelation which is the same Elohim as Moses saw and described back there in Exodus that we just read. And his head and his hair is white like wool. There was a cloud over here, and a cloud is generally gray and white. He's girded about the paps with a golden girdle. The high priest, which operated in the tabernacle, which he, he had shown Moses over here, not at the beginning, but a little later on, he showed Moses that he was as the high priest and would have the same garments for glory and beauty that are depicted here. And there's a golden sash, and, uh, or I mean a golden, uh, my brain is not working, but anyway, uh, on this breastplate made of gold. And then uh, you can see it here, his feet were as fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, which Again, with the tabernacle pattern down in that lower section, there's a brazen altar with fire in it. And that would be at the foot area of the, of the tabernacle pattern. And this is the tabernacle pattern over here. So you see in the foot area, the fire in the altar. And at the foot area over here, the, the feet as if fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, compared with the tabernacle here. Okay. So this shows the tabernacle opened up to the interior, so it's revealed. This shows the tabernacle closed up so that it's concealed. And here Yahweh Elohim has his arm folded so that the mysteries are locked up inside of him. And then later on, he opens things up and opens up his arms, as you see in the book of Revelation, he describes it. And that is the revelation of Yahshua the Messiah. He opens up and reveals himself and his purpose. So anyway, you see the comparison of the two. That's basically the principle I'm trying to get you to see that what John saw, what Moses saw, they were basically both Yahweh Elohim, but John saw him in his great glorification first. All right, um, finish reading, please, Dr. Underwood. And his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. Mm -hmm. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Okay, so that's what he said, the countenance as the sun shineth in his strength. Back here he said it was the body of heaven and his clearness. And if you're a Bible student, Look up the word clearness in a Strong's Concordance. You will find this is the only place in the Bible where that word is used that way, and it means brightness or brilliance. And so, again, this shining brightness here, shining brightness here, and I'll mention this. This same John the Apostle saw Yahshua transfigure on the Mount uh, of Tabor, the Mount of Transfiguration, or Tabor, with John, with Peter, and James during the ministry of Yahshua. And again, there's a lot of comparison between how he appeared here, here, and here in those visions. And here it talks about him having his uh, raiment as white as the light, 
And in another place, it talks about so bright that no fuller on earth could whiten it. Um, so again, that same comparison, he's the body of light that is the light of the world. And so there's another comment that was made I'm going to reference back to. Uh, John talked about, I heard a voice behind me, and I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And when I turned, I saw those seven golden candlesticks, um, or the seven lampstands, which are the things that he just said he had in his right hand, seven stars, which are as the seven candlesticks or lampstands. Um, uh, in any case, when he said, I turned to see the voice, this is a comment that is important to understand. Uh, John is sitting on an exposed area of land above the water. He's lifted up out of the water on an island. Moses is on a lifted up piece of land here called a mountain. And Moses is in the cloud, in the spirit. John says, I was in the spirit on the Sabbath day which is the day of eternity. So they're both in eternity here, eternity here, okay? And both of them are. And if you go to the tabernacle pattern by comparison, tabernacle here, tabernacle here, tabernacle that's physical right here. If you go to the tabernacle for comparison, and the most holy place would, would be allegorical of the face and head section here and here. If you go to the most holy place of the tabernacle, which would also be shown here and here, Yahweh Elohim appeared once a year between the wings of the cherubim in bright shining light. And he, that people call that the flash of the Shekinah. Um, but uh, he, it says in the Bible that he would appear. And he's appearing in this bright light. Now, John is within this pattern also. Dr. Kinley talked about, we, we are within this archetype pattern. Everything is within the pattern. So you have to ask, where is Moses? Where is John? Well, both of them are, comparatively speaking, on the top of this altar of incense in the holy place or the middle compartment of the tabernacle. There's a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. And they are in the middle compartment of the tabernacle, just like Moses is in the wilderness of Sinai, which is the middle section of the migration. They migrated from Egypt through the wilderness into Canaan land. And you see down here, it talks about Egypt, outer court, wilderness of Sinai, holy place says holy place right here. And in Psalms, it talks about the wilderness was the holy place. And then they went to the promised land or Canaan land. And that was the most holy place of the migration. And the most holy place of the tabernacle is that innermost part, the highest upper part you'd see here or here or here. And that compares with the head uh, and face which are shining brilliantly and brightly. And you'll see that his eyes even were as a flame of fire. And that's, of course, all that brightness. And this cloud that lit up here was a pillar of fire by night. So there's all the comparisons. I'm just trying to get you to see the comparisons here so that you can recognize that what John's writing about in Revelation, what Moses is writing about, in Genesis and Exodus and so forth, those things actually fit together. And how do they fit together? By the pattern of the tabernacle, which is the thing that was displayed by Yahweh Elohim to explain who he is, okay, and, and how he operates. All right, now, oh, I was going to make one other comment. John said, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And you just read that his voice was as the sound of many waters. Okay, so if I look at the tabernacle pattern, I said John was sitting here on this altar of incense. That is part of a triangular configuration in the holy place of the tabernacle, like the mountain is a triangular piece of land in the 
my, in the wilderness of Sinai, which is the holy place of the migration, okay? And the cloud is on top of the mountain, just like the cloud of incense is on top of the inner, uh, or is on top of the altar of incense where John is sitting and Moses is sitting. And John is right here. And John is in the spirit on the Sabbath day, the cloud and eternity representing the spirit. And John is in this little mountain partially submerged underwater, which is in the holy place comparatively like Moses and like the altar. So now John, when he's sitting there, he's looking toward the most holy place to start with waiting for the revelation of Yahshua when he would appear here between the wings of the cherubim. But he heard, here's the voice behind him, which is this way. John's sitting here facing this way, but the water in the laver is behind John back here. And the voice as of many waters calls to John and John turns to see this voice that spoke with him and being turned, he saw seven golden candlesticks. And the seven golden candlesticks are the seven branches of the lampstand are right here in the tabernacle. Okay? Um, and uh, that actually compares with the burning bush. Just a second, please. What's that? Oh, I can scroll them. Okay, thank you. He just told me I can scroll these. Okay, good. So let me, yeah, I'm going to see what I can do. Yeah, some of these are, let me see if I can find you another one that's even better for what I'm trying to illustrate. Even in this one, you can see the tabernacle a little better. The lampstand here, John's here, and so forth. The cloud here, cloud here, cloud here. Okay. Holy place here, holy place here. Okay. And behind him is the water of the laver and the altar of burnt offering. John turns to see this voice, which is as a voice of many waters. He sees the lampstand, the seven golden candlesticks here. That's depicted here, not up here on his face, but here in the chest region where he would be holding the lamps in his hand, okay? Um, which are as the seven stars of the seven angels of the seven assemblies uh, here. Um, and in the holy place of the migration, you can't see it very well, but there's a, a, set, um, a burning bush over here in the holy place. And uh, okay, so David, while you read, I'm going to see if I can scroll through these and find some pictures that help out. Please continue to read. Moses, Aaron, arrow one. Moses was shown in a vision the Elohim of Israel in super incorporeal form, I'm, I'm okay. a great heavenly anthropomorphic being as the threefold archetype, original pattern, transformed into the threefold intangible tabernacle, which he was admonished of Yahweh to build after the pattern shown him in the vision while in the mount. John, arrow 1a. John in his vision on the Isle of Patmos heard the voice that spake with him and he turned and saw Elohim who is as we understand him to be the resurrected and glorified sanctuary or temple in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks clothed with a garment down to the feet and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, which was typified by the garments of beauty and glory and the ephod with 12 precious stones therein worn by the priest and the furnishings of the tabernacle and the golden overlaid covering of the temple with its inter interior furnishings. His hairs were white like wool, which were symbolized by the cloud that overshadowed the tabernacle. 
and the cloud above the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which typified the powerful effect of all the spoken words of Yahweh Elohim that expressed his purpose from beginning to the end, including the words engraved in the tables of stone with the finger of Elohim and laid in the Ark of the Covenant, and the words written in the heart and mind by the Holy Spirit under the new covenant. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. This was typified by the temple elevated on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, overlaid with gold and decked with precious stones and the sunlight shining thereupon sending its dazzling rays upon the brightness until the brightness could not be looked upon with the naked eye. His eyes were as a flame of fire, typified by the Shekinah, or light that flashed in the cloud between the wings of the cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant after the atonement was made for Israel. His feet, like unto fine brass, typified by the brazen altar and labor in the outer court. The superincorporeal body of Elohim in Yahweh is the true sanctuary of sanctuaries. John wrote in Revelation 11, 1 through 3, thusly. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of Elohim and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. And the new heaven and new earth, I saw no temple therein, for Yahweh Elohim Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Okay, good. I'm having a lot of difficulty getting exactly what I want to show you on the chart, but I hope you've been able to compare the things that have been read and that have been explained with the pictures that are on the charts. All right, uh, let's just continue to read a little bit more and um, I'll be sensitive to the time here. I think we've got half an hour or so left. Uh, please continue. Arrow number one compared to arrow number 1A. I am going to try to get that. I cannot seem to get it at all. I don't understand why. Um, there. I don't know if she can help out. As in the beginning of Moses' vision of the creation of the heaven and earth, by the pattern of the tabernacle, we also find a prophetic confirmation in the beginning of John's vision, which he recorded in Revelation. For as we have already stated, the new heaven and earth are drawn out of the old, just as the New Testament was drawn out of the old. Okay, go ahead. Moses, yeah, go arrow ahead. one. In the beginning of Moses' oh. vision, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. 
John, arrow 1A, I, John, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of Elohim and for the testimony of Yahshua, the Messiah. I was in the spirit on the Sabbath day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet and his voice as the voice of many waters. Moses, arrow one. In the beginning of Moses' vision of the creation of heaven and earth, the earth was covered or surrounded with water. Moses heard the spirit wind moving upon the face of the water. Moses in his vision saw and heard Elohim create beginning with the first day through each day to the sixth day inclusive from beginning to end. And then Elohim rested the seventh day or Sabbath. Okay, so Moses is seeing Yahweh Elohim create Genesis, the first chapter, accounts uh, what Moses saw with a very brief summary of what he saw each of seven days of that vision. And it says in the evening and the morning were the first day, in the evening and morning were the second day, and the evening and morning were the third day, and the fourth day, and the fifth day, and the sixth day, and on the seventh day, Yahweh Elohim rested or took a Sabbath. Okay, That's what he's referring to, and that's what you're seeing here is the way Moses saw Yahweh Elohim create during the first seven days of 40 days of vision that Moses is on Mount Sinai and the written brief synopsis of what Moses saw is what is recorded in Genesis, the first chapter. Okay, please continue reading. John, arrow 1a. In the beginning of John's Moses, John's vision, mm -hmm. he was on the Isle of Patmos, which was surrounded with water mm -hmm. on the Sabbath day mm -hmm. and heard a great voice as the sound of many waters behind him. And he turned to see him, Elohim in superincorporeal form that spake with him as he described in Revelation 1, 10 through 16. And being turned around, he also saw the angels with the seven seals, seven vials, seven trumpets, and heard the seven thunders utter their voices. As Moses has seen and heard in the creation of the old heaven and earth, but he was told not to write what the seven thirds thunders uttered, which represented the seven days of creation, because Moses had already heard, seen, and written it. So John writes that he heard these seven thunders, but he was told not to write it, and that's because each day that Yahweh Elohim spoke this vision, it came out as a thunder and so the seven thunders were what Yahweh Elohim spoke during seven days of the vision. Each day, he is showing Moses and John how he, Yahweh Elohim, is creating by the pattern, which is really himself, the archetype of the original pattern. The, he's creating the creation. And he shows this to, in seven days, including the seventh day or Sabbath day of rest, and so since Moses had written that in Genesis, the first chapter, and also in the seventh chapter, which is a, um, a uh, supplement to the first chapter, then John was told not to write what the voice of the seven thunders had said, because Moses already had written it. All right, please continue. Thus John was looking from the ending back to the beginning. Mm-hmm. John was looking from the ending after Yahshua had died, buried, resurrected, and that's where he ended or fulfilled his ministry, did the will of Yahweh, finished, finished 
the uh, uh, works that Yahweh Elohim had begun back here. This is where he begun the works of creation. And when he came down here in this physical body, this is when he did in earth the things that were done in heaven and uh, where he finished the work that the Father had given him to do. And when he died, buried, resurrected, and ascended, you see him here in that ascended glorified body well, John is viewing him 63 years after he had finished doing this glorification. So John is picking it up in the ending and seeing that back to the beginning. Please read on. Arrow number two compared to arrow number 2A. Okay. The account which Moses gives of Elohim's command to slay the Paschal lamb in the beginning of the migration of the Israelites from Egypt, as recorded in Exodus 12, 1 through 6, is a confirmation of Revelation 13, 8, which John saw of Elohim as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, if, actually, if we could have one of the readers read Revelation 13, 8, I'd appreciate that. And that is... Revelation 13, 8. Yep. And all that dwell upon the herd shall worship him, whose name are not written in the book of life, of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, so the book, the he's talking about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world or the beginning of the creation. And there was a Passover lamb at the beginning of the migration that had to be slain before they could exit out of Egypt uh, or take their migration from Egypt. And that Passover lamb was a manifestation of Yahshua, who was the Lamb of Yahweh, who was slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, what it means is, before the creation could exit out of spirit, or take its exodus and migrate from this abstract pure spirit into shape and form, and then into the concrete materialization of the physical creation that Yahweh Elohim made by the pattern before anything could be made by the pattern, okay, he had to take on shape and form as he first existed in an abstract state without any apparent or descriptive shape and form. And so he has to give up that life of unlimited potential and luxury and restrict himself to a specific form. In other words, one express embodiment. And he uh, put all of his glorification and hope into this operation, this one embodiment. And, but yet that was a great crucifixion. He's coming out of pure spirit, which is his high, high and lofty state and coming down into an intermediate state so since he's given that up and coming into here, that's a crucifixion. That's as if he's giving up a life of unlimited potential uh, to be what he willed to be here, just like this lamb has to be slain and this has to occur before they can migrate out of Egypt. This has to occur before the creation can be brought out of or migrate out of spirit, All right? Please continue reading. Moses, arrow two. And Elohim spake to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it, 
according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Okay, so there's many correlations we can talk about here and show how Yahshua the Messiah is the one that fulfilled all of that. Uh, but uh, I don't think I need to comment a whole lot more right now on that. So let's continue reading. John, arrow 2a. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, the beast, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb, Yahshua the Messiah, slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. Okay, maybe I should comment now, because we read it in the Bible, now it's read from the textbook. This, if you can see it right here. Yahweh Elohim, when he appears to Moses, there is a book right here. Yeah, all right. And the truth is, he is the book of life. He has all life or light within him when he comes into shape and form. But Moses sees in the vision uh, Yahweh Elohim and describes this as a book of life in which there are all the names written of everybody that will ever exist. As Dr. Kinley said, uh, even your aliases were written in that book. And Yahweh said he would blot out those who sinned against him out of this book. But anyway, so just wanted to mention that. And it's the book of life of the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world before the creation before the migration. That's what this is talking about. Please read. Moses, arrow two. Yahweh Elohim spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt to instruct the Israelites to slay the Paschal lamb, the stingy night of the 14th before the beginning of their migration from Egypt. Mm-hmm. John, arrow 2a. John was made to see in his vision the events of the Passover in Egypt and the beginning of the migration. This is compared with Moses' vision in the cloud atop Mount Sinai, where he saw the beginning of the creation while in the presence of Elohim. Moses first heard the voice of Elohim and then saw in the vision Yahweh's superincorporeal form, which is Elohim, the archetype pattern. It was from this form that Moses saw Elohim create the universe. This taking on of, the, of superincorporeal form from pure spirit and then transforming in part into the creation was Yahweh departing from the pure state of invisibility to a lesser state of visibility or the intermediate state. Thus, it was a Passover from pure spirit to revealed incorporeal invisibility or being slain, which made John to understand that Yahshua was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, great, continue. Arrow three compared to arrow number three A. The account of Aaron Nadab and Abihu, together with Moses and the 70 elders of Israel, seeing in a vision Elohim in supercorporeal form, which is the word of Yahweh, Yahshua, 
transformed into the threefold intangible tabernacle is comparable to the experiences of Peter, James, and John witnessing in a vision the transfiguration and also the ascension of Yahshua in incorporeal form in the fulfillment of the law and prophets as recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. Good. Continue, please. I will. I got to scroll down to the page. Okay. <laughs> Moses, Errol 3. Then, then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the Elohim of Israel, the archetype pattern. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. And look that thou make them the tabernacle and his furnishings after their pattern, which was shown thee in the mount. John, arrow 3a. After six days, Joshua taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, John the Baptist, talking with him. Then Peter, then answered Peter and said, unto Yahshua, Master, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Yahshua only. And as they came down from the mountain, Yahshua charged them saying, tell the vision to no man until the son of man be risen again from the dead. The fulfillment of the law which Moses wrote, Yahshua the Messiah did come to fulfill the law and the prophets, as he said in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, the same incorporeal form which Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, together with Moses and the 70 elders saw in Mount Sinai had to be seen in a vision in fulfillment by Peter, James, and John at the transfiguration of Yahshua in incorporeal form in the Mount of Transfiguration and also at the ascension of the Messiah, which was a resurrected incorporeal body. As Moses saw in the vision, the incorporeal form, Elohim, transform into the threefold intangible tabernacle, being the first prophet to prophesy under the law. And John the Baptist was the last to prophesy to the coming of Yahshua the Messiah, who was also under the law. Then it was necessary for Moses and John the Baptist to appear in the transfiguration. Since Moses was shown the vision of the tabernacle, Peter, James, and John heard his conversation concerning the tabernacle, which caused Peter to make the statement, let us make here three tabernacles one for thee and one for Moses 
and one for Elias, John the Baptist. Okay, um, exactly where are you reading in the textbook? Can you give me a page number and paragraph? Uh, that should be just a second if you would bear with me. Page 75. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, yep, that's what I thought, okay. Um, and I'm looking here. Okay, so he mentioned Matthew 5, 17 and 18. And I want to have that read. I'm going to take a moment here to try to emphasize a point that is absolutely crucial to understand. And that is that Yahshua the Messiah, when he came into that physical body into the world, was fulfilling. He was doing the will of Yahweh. He was finishing the work that he had set up when he created everything. And uh, Matthew 5, 17 is one scripture I want. And then since you're in Matthew, please also get Matthew 3, 13 through 15. And um, we may have a couple of other scriptures if we have time. Um, and then uh, did you, by the way, David, did you finish that section that you're at? Is there any more in that section? We're coming up on arrow four. Yeah, we haven't. I, I just want you to read up to that point, and the scripture readers can get those scriptures, and then we're going to stop here uh, before we get to arrow uh, four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come. I I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew 5, 17. Okay, so he said he did not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but he did come to fulfill them. He is fulfilling them. And to finish something is to fulfill it. To fulfill means to finish, to complete, to end, to bring to its conclusion, to satisfy all the requirements of. Okay. Um, go ahead and read, please. In Matthew 3, 13 through 15. Uh, Matthew 3, you want to start at 13? Yes, sir. Then cometh Joshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Yahshua answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Okay, so when Yahshua is coming to be baptized, he is not coming to institute a Christian sacrament. He is coming to fulfill something that has already been established and set up. And there were many people that came to be baptized by John before Yahshua, and uh, Yahshua is coming to fulfill it, to end it, to satisfy all the requirements so that that type of baptism would no longer be needed, but that there he would end up giving a better baptism, a spiritual baptism, or a baptism with the Holy Spirit, uh, at the proper time. And um, so anyway, the point is, Yahshua is fulfilling. And that's what he said in Matthew 5, 17, didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. Um, anyway, go over to John 4, 34, if you would. And then, um, well, just go over to John 4, 34 for this moment. John 4, 34. Yahshua said unto them, My food is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. So that's what Yahshua was doing. He was doing the will of the Father, the will of the one of the Father that sent him, and to finish his work. Now he had started his work when he made the creation. Yahshua is coming into finish everything 
fulfill, satisfy all of his requirements, do everything that was necessary to bring the old covenant to a satisfactory end, satisfying Yahweh's needs, not satisfying the children of Israel. They're not going to be satisfied as long as their mind is set on trying to be righteous of their own works. But Yahshua is going to do everything necessary for righteousness, and then all those that accept him will be fulfilled or satisfied in Yahshua the Messiah. The same is true today. Our righteousness is not earned by our own works, but if we will accept that Yahshua the Messiah has done everything required for us to be uh, reconciled unto Yahweh and made right with, with, with Yahweh, and just accept that and accept the works of Yahshua as being a fulfillment or satisfaction, then we will be very well satisfied uh, in our soul and in our spirit because he will put his Holy Spirit in us and cause us to experience his righteousness, his peace, and his joy. You'll be in his kingdom and, and you'll know it. Um, so, uh, again, to emphasize that Yahshua fulfilled, finished, ended. Uh, let me go over, please, also to Luke um, 24, uh, start at 27, go a couple of verses, and then go over to 44. Luke 24 and 27. Mm-hmm. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. 44. Now remember, remember the scriptures concerned Yahshua. What scriptures is he talking about? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Not at all. They had not been written when Yahshua did this. And the scriptures he's talking about are the Old Testament scriptures, the things that Moses wrote that we're reading about back here such as that Paschal lamb in the, in the land of Egypt. Yahshua the Messiah is the true Passover sacrifice for us. Yahshua the Messiah is the lamb of Yahweh slain from the foundation of the world. He is the true tabernacle, which uh, was made because Yahweh had to make it uh, that he might dwell among them. And then he prophesied later on that he would be called Emmanuel, which means Yahweh with us or dwelling with us. Then when Yahshua the Messiah came in the world, he was Yahweh manifest in the flesh, dwelling with those apostles. So he was the fulfillment of the tabernacle, the sacrifices in the tabernacle, the Passover lamb. He was the high priest and bishop of our soul, which fulfills the priest in the tabernacle. He is all and in all the reality or the fulfillment of it. So anyway, so he was instructing or teaching these two people that uh, you're reading about here in Luke 24 about him being the fulfillment, such as he's the bread of life. Um, and back in the wilderness of Sinai, that Yahweh gave them manna for bread. In the holy place of the tabernacle, they had bread that they baked every Sabbath. So yeah, you see all of this is fulfilled by Yahshua. He is everything that's back there. And, and what we're seeing is setting this up uh, by the vision. And I want you to be able to compare one thing with another so you can really understand in the end that Yahshua is the satisfaction and the reality and the perfection of all of these things. All right, uh, please read there in Luke 24 and go over to uh, 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. All right, so that is, that's what he was doing, was fulfilling. And when he taught them that, what happened? What was the effect of it on them? Please read. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Now, that was the first time these people even 
understood anything in reality about the scriptures at all. They knew the words of it. They knew the commandments. They knew the ceremonial practices. They knew the prophecies, but they didn't understand that it was all about Yahshua. This was the first time that they understood why the scriptures were even written. They were written to testify of Yahshua. Um, that was the purpose for the scriptures. And it still is. The purpose is to tell about Yahshua. Uh, um, I think we're about out of time. I know we started a little bit late. I don't want to run us completely over time. But I hope that helps. And we'll take up this comparison of John's and Moses' vision further at another time. And I ask you all to please tune in Sunday at 11 o'clock. Um, uh, now, this may be uh, possibly the last Sunday that we will, or last time this coming Sunday, possibly may be the last time that we will have an opportunity to do another Zoom class quite like this before we um, do some classroom presentations. So tune in again Sunday morning at 11, and I'll turn it back over to the moderator uh, for closing up everything. Thank you. Hope this was helpful in your understanding of Yahshua. All right. Thank you, Dr. Welsh. Uh, that brings a close to our class for this evening. It was a wonderful class. I hope you all enjoyed it. And as he said, we hope that you join, join with him on Sunday at 11 o'clock. So for the doxology, so that we may be dismissed. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present your souls faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. And thank you for joining us this evening. And thank you, Dr. Uh, David Underwood, for the illustrations with the arrows. We appreciate that. That's a great tool. Thank you all on YouTube for watching. I see you, Carol. Lansing, hallelujah. Paula, all, all of you, Debbie White, Iris, all, all of you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you that those are here. I'm going to sign off of YouTube and then we can talk amongst ourselves.